actually audio stream. Alright, audio. Okay. Hello? Test?
anybody's here yet. Assuming that thing is telling me correctly. If somebody's here waiting and I'm not seeing it, say something in the chat. Otherwise, I'll give it another couple of minutes. start since it's getting recorded anyway. One more minute because I've still got a good bit of stuff to get through. So, some folks may have to go back and watch the first bit.
So wait. Okay. So, uh, last week we covered uh, genotyping, uh, and we've sort of led up to this with PCR and gel electrophoresis. And so, uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, submitting and analyzing DNA. Now, um, once you've done your PCR, you've made a, a copy of a very specific region. Now, if you want to uh, run it on a gel, that'll tell you some things, like it can tell you the length of that region that you've amplified, and you can get creative with different ways to um, try and figure out what's going on, but the most direct way and the most solid way to really know that what you uh, to really know what you have um, is to sequence it. And so the when you're talking about short sequences, the easiest and cheapest way is to do something called Sanger sequencing. Now, Sanger sequencing isn't something that you're going to be able to do. Um, okay. All right. Looks like some people are watching. It's just not showing up on my thing. Sorry, guys. All right. So the um, uh, so Sanger sequencing. Sanger sequencing is super cheap, um, but it's not something you're going to do in your home lab. It's something you're going to send off for, but it's like seven dollars to eleven dollars, depending. Um, okay. So I may not be getting the chat. Let me try reloading this. This may make things weird for a second. Oh, okay. I see three. So, Sanger sequence. Okay. One second. Okay, I see you now. Alright. <clears throat> so, uh, the company that I like to use, and a lot of people use, is... Um, uh, called GeneWiz. GeneWiz is a U.S. company, so if you're outside the U.S., you're going to have to find a different company. Probably you could ship it internationally, but you don't want to do that. Um, uh, GeneWiz is pretty easy, um, but you got to think about the sample that you're submitting and and you know what you're looking for out of it. So if you're just submitting some uh, PC or some plasmid that you received and you want to check the sequence and know for sure that it really is what it's supposed to be. Uh, that can be fairly easy. Um, you may not need to do much sample prep at all, just kind of send them some plasmid, but we'll go through that. Uh, if you're looking to do sort of the continuation of what we've been working on with things like um, uh, uh, genotyping, then it's going to be PCR product. And so I'm going to switch this over to display capture. Okay. Let's go to GeneWiz. Okay. So let's say you want to uh, you want to get Sanger sequencing done. Okay. You're gonna log into GeneWiz. And you're gonna go Sanger sequencing. Click that. And they're gonna have several options. You have plasmid. PCR product that's been purified, PCR product that's unpurified, they can do also do colonies and glycerol stocks. But for right now, we're going to be focusing on uh, PCR product unpurified. If you're doing uh, PCR product purified, that means that you it's a little bit cheaper, and plasmid, uh, depending on how you do it, can be a little bit cheaper. If you're um, if you're collecting, uh, depending on the kind of data you want. Um, you can take uh, and purify the, the PCR products yourself uh, and that can be maybe slightly cheaper but really it's not worth the headache because you got to run two gels and you got to run um, you got to run the purification protocol and so you got to buy another kit for that and it really isn't worth it in my opinion so for me it's always going to either be plasmid or PCR product unpurified now uh, that means that they'll purify the product for you, and that means a couple of things. For plasmid, if you have a, a pure, just sample of plasmid in a tube, and you want uh, to sequence it, if it's got universal primers, uh, because Sanger sequencing is very similar um, to PCR. It's, it's, it's not a chain reaction, but it does use primer extension with polymerases. So. You have your DNA template and you have a primer. 
and in this case it's a sequencing primer. Sequencing is a little bit different from PCR because since you're not trying to do an exponential chain reaction, you only have the, um, the single primer. So it'll start priming, it'll start from the primer site and sequence for about 800 to 1000 bases or until you hit the end of the template and then just stop. And so during that time they'll read the DNA. Now, um, if you're sequencing plasmid, remember that you only want to provide one primer. Uh, and often plasmids are made with uh, common features. And those features uh, will be things like M13 sites and promoter sites and recombination sites. And you can find uh, the sequences that you're looking for uh, in those sort of recombinant plasmids because there's all these universal primers that are free. So you can take your plasmid and say it's got an M13 site, which is a very common sequencing site in plasmids. You can send the plasmid in. You can say, check it with M13 forward. It'll, they'll take your plasmid. They will uh, use the M13 forward primer and sequence your plasmid. And from there, you will have uh, from M13 in the direction of the primer uh, for about 800 bases or so. And you'll have to compare that to what it's supposed to be, and we'll go through that as well. Now, um, that's pretty simple, but PCR product unpurified is a little bit different. Uh, because it's a PCR product, it's already got two primers in it. And that's one of the reasons you need to purify it. Because if it's already got the primers in it, when they start the sequencing reaction, it'll start, uh, it'll start priming with the primers left over from your PCR. So the first thing they do is wash all that out, get rid of the polymerases, get rid of everything, uh, and then just get down to the pure uh, PCR product DNA, and then you add primers. So that means when you're packaging your unpurified PCR product, you need to, in a separate tube, add your primers. If you're doing something with a purified PCR product or even a plasmid that doesn't have uh, a universal site that's convenient, then you can actually add the primer yourself to the sample and send it off and they'll just run it primer and template mixed together already. <clears throat> but <clears throat> what this is going to look like is you're going to go PCR product unpurified and we're just going to assume that this is your um, you know, genotyping run. I think because of the stream my internet's very slow. This may take a second. Okay, not too bad. All right, so it's a strange little interface, but all right. DNA type, PCR, unpurified type. With unpurified, it's always going to be custom, uh, but if you're doing purified or plasmid, there's a couple of different options, pre-mixed and uh, these sorts of things, and if it's pre-mixed, then that means you've already put the primer in there with the template and they just run it. If it's predefined, then you just tell them what primer to use and then uh, send your um, uh, uh, primer in a separate tube and then they add it. Uh, but since they have to do the extra step of purifying it and then adding the primer, they're calling this custom, which is more expensive. It's $11 instead of 7 but still worth it. Uh, the number of samples, uh, let's just assume you have one sample. But if you have more than one sample, you'll just get more of these, well, let's do it like this. You'll just get more of these little uh, cells to fill out. Now, let me check over here. Uh, M13 sites are in plasmids just for sequencing, yes. Um, M13 is a virus, a phage, uh, but people have been using uh, M13 sites for sequencing for a long time, so it's just kind of stuck. But there's a lot of other sites. Um, some of them are for things that are commonly used like recombination sites and things like that. So uh, you're going to take your DNA name, say it's like um, you know, David Sample 1 uh, Genotyping. Okay, then you're going to take your DNA length and this is important because it helps them know how they need to dilute things. So if you've run your PCR product out on the gel, you've been able to read it across from the ladder. 
So when you ran it across from the ladder, it should have been about 750 or so bases. So that's going to put you about 500 to 1,000. Then you need to put your primer. Now in this case, uh, you're going to use you know, whatever your primer is. Um, uh, I think it's you know, whatever forward primer. Um, and then you're going to put your, um, your primer name. And it's important that whatever name you type here is the same thing that you put on the tube that you send them with the primer. Now, you can also build up a library if you've already sent them primers or if they manufactured them for you, and you can click here and select from a library of, of uh, primers. I have this one in my library. Um, and then uh, you can also use a GeneWiz primer, one that they have in their library of primers like T7, M13, those sorts of things, right? Uh, and then if there's something weird, you know, that you may have to tell them about, give them a little warning, and you can put whatever you want in the notes. Um, now, if you're packaging your primers, um, that's basically what you're going to do, is you're going to uh, give them this information, if you have more than one. The thing to look out for here is the tube uh, number. So, if this is, uh, if sample number one isn't what you're going to put on the tube, what you're going to actually write on the tube is like DI1, DI2, DI3, and that'll be depending on you, it'll be your name, so it'll be like whatever one. Now, if we're going to make, I'll, I'll sort of mock up a sample. Let me see, switch back to here. Okay, so everybody see me all right? Okay, now, if you're uh, making a sample, then let's say you've got your PCR product, right? And, or let's say, uh, let's start with a real PCR product. Okay, so you've got your PCR product, right? Uh, yes, my primer could be either the forward or reverse, depending on which end you wanted to read from. And so we can, we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, or you could send both as two separate reactions, not together, but as two separate reactions and read one one way and one the other way and then compare them at the end. Uh, and so let's say you have your PCR reaction and you're going to send them the whole thing as an unpurified reaction. So you're just going to load this into a tube. Now, I tend to like the tubes with the screw caps and the little O-rings because they're really secure. Um, the issue with these kind of tubes, if you just send them like they are, just like this, is they can come open in the mail. Uh, so you're going to need to seal it up better than this. Now, uh, the easiest way to do that that works really well is with parafilm. Uh, you can also use tape, but if you've got parafilm, it's this laboratory film, this stuff is super stretchy and will go way farther than you think, but you need to label it first. So we're going to label, label this. Let's see, if you look at, let me swap back to this. If you look at uh, their, uh, they they really want you to sample, to send them in these strips, right? Um, but you, you really don't have to do that. And they have this whole thing on uh, sample submission, they're, they're sort of guidelines. So if you look here, they've got a whole page on uh, sample prep. If you need like a refresher on this, see exactly what they want. And let's see. So you can do, you know, and they have different things for different things. So if you're doing uh, plasmids, you know, they tell you how much they want and in how much. Um, if you're going to do it as the pre-mixed. But okay, so we're going to do... Uh, let's see, DI1 through 3. Uh, this video capture gets crazy when you click on it. Okay, so I they, they want you to label it on the side. I like to label the side and the top because just in case one gets rubbed off, it doesn't have to be pretty. 
Then you're going to take your parafilm and you're just going to go crazy with it. So this parafilm is uh, it's wax, it's really stretchy. And don't stretch it too hard or it'll break. But I like to go around. And get a nice seal on it. It's kind of cocooned and all that. And that won't come over. And that does two things for you. One, um, if you're shipping things, obviously it could spill. But also, uh, these tubes, their structural integrity is really based on that cap being closed. Once the cap opens, they're just super crushable. And I've had them just be squished flat in the mail, and then your sample's gone, right? Um, and then, of course, you're going to take your uh, primer DNA, and you're going to get a new tube, and you're going to load it up. Now, if you're sending primer, what they actually ask for is 5 micromolar of primer. So typical um, primer concentrations are uh, 10 micromolar. Send the GFP for sequencing instead. Uh, okay, we can talk more about uh, the other experiment at the end. But the um, the typical concentration of primers in their working stock concentration is uh, 10 micromolar. So for sequencing, they really want half that. They want five micromolar. So you can do it one of two ways. You can either take, and you don't need to send them much. They won't use much at all. Uh, so you can send them like. 10 microliters of your primer with 10 microliters of water added to it to dilute it down to 5 micromolar. Uh, or you can just tell them in the comment section that it's five that it's 10 micromolar. So if you just put over here in the notes that it's 10 micromolar, they'll dilute it, do whatever, because they've got to do all this custom work anyway. They really don't care. And uh, they're very flexible and they have good customer service, so they'll they'll work with you if you screw things up a little bit. So uh, don't be intimidated to send them something if you're not sure it's perfectly perfect. And of course, if you want to check, then you can check, right? Uh, and you can ask me or whatever. And also, I do want to say this as well. Okay, so if you're uh, your tubes are ready. Let's say you've got two tubes. Let's just pretend this one's got uh, let's pretend this one's got my sample and this one's got my primer. Now if I was sending them three samples I'd have three samples but still just one tube of primer. If Assuming they're all using the same primer, right? So if I did, for example, the human uh, genotyping uh, experiment and I did me, you know, my wife and kids then I would have all those samples in tubes, and they would all be labeled DI1, DI2, DI3, DI4, uh, but then my primer would be labeled with the primer name. And so uh, I'd have so many tubes for my experiments and another tube for my primer. Now the way they want you to mail these things, not GeneWiz, they're pretty flexible, but like, I think it's the proper way. Put them in a small envelope because you want a couple of layers of containment and you want something for absorption. So generally what I do is I'll put a little piece of paper towel in my envelope. That way if anything spills, you're not spilling, you know, biotech all in the mail. And so you've got a secondary barrier, you got your primary barrier, which is the tube itself, secondary barrier, something absorbent, and then put that in like a bubble envelope. That works great. I use them all the time. You can do, uh, you can overnight them or whatever. The only time I've ever had trouble with that was when it got lost in the mail and spent forever going through various places, but I think it was me that screwed that up anyway. So uh, generally, DNA is very, very stable. You don't have to worry about like trying to ship it cold in a box with dry ice or anything like that. If DNA was that unstable, we would all die. So uh, DNA is fine at room temperature for a long, long time. Um, let's see. So you have your sample. And display capture. And you have uh, put your primer name, 
primer forward. Um, let's say 10 micromolar primer. And then we go uh, save and review. Ah, oh, okay. That's fine. Okay, it's because I didn't put three in. Save and review. Okay. One thing that's aggravating about their interface is they don't like spaces. Okay. Now save and review. Okay. Uh, or you can put in the primer concentration there. Okay. You can say my primer, or you can select uh, one of their primers if they have it in your library, right? Confirm. And then it'll give you the price. Uh, that's actually cheaper than it was before. Okay. So there you go. Add to cart, pay for it, etc. I'm going to cancel. Okay, so that's pretty easy. One thing that they will ask you to do. Nope. Okay, so one thing that they are going to ask you to do is inside, before you seal the bubble envelope, uh, they're going to give you a sheet of paper that you're going to need to print out. And that's going to have a barcode on it and sort of the information about your uh, sample. So you're going to take this sample and you're going to take that sheet of paper that you print out and as soon as you pay for it, it'll pop up in a PDF and ask you to, to print it off. Take that piece of paper, print it off, take both of them, put them in the bubble envelope, send it off. Um, if you don't do that, they'll get a tube and have no idea what it goes to. Maybe they could sort it out with the tube labeling, but you may not be the only DI or whoever in uh, who has a sample active right then. So uh, print off the piece of paper, then do it, then seal your bubble envelope. Now, let's look at what it looks like when you get your results back. Okay, so let's look at some results that I have had before. Uh, this comes from a project I've been working on for a while uh, where I'm trying to fix a mutation in dogs. Uh, from this, it's mutations in the SLC2A9 gene cause hyperuricemia in the dog. Um, and basically, it's a mutation, and I trying to have a way to easily identify that mutation. These guys uh, identified it, and so I want to be able to screen my puppies and other people's puppies for it, and if I CRISPR modify it, I want to be able to prove that the puppies that I have, uh, if I have a litter of 12 and three of them have been fixed, I want to be able to see which is which. So uh, these are the primers that they used. I just pulled them right out of the paper. And so I ordered those primers, and uh, I'm able to look for this mutation. Now, uh, I ran my PCR, and I sent off PCR to GeneWiz, and I sent it as uh, unpurified PCR product right here. So you can see SLC2A9 Vulcan 1. Vulcan's the dog's name. Uh, let's view the results. Now, the first thing you'll see when you see this is you're going to see the sample name, and you're going to see uh, the primer. So this is SLC2A9 forward, it's tube DI1, etc, etc. So the QS is the quality score. Now the quality score in this case, basically anything above 40 is good. So this is a really good quality score, that means that the run went well and everything did what it's supposed to do. And this is um, uh, the, the read length, and so uh, it went 377 bases from uh, the continuous read length. So from where it started reading smoothly, it went 377 bases. And that's pretty short. Normally, PCR goes 800, or excuse me, Sanger sequencing goes 800 to 1,000. But the reason it stopped is because it got to the end. What I sent them was a short piece of DNA, so of course the sequence is short. Um, but it kind of flagged it a little bit as maybe something's up uh, because the read length was short, but this is exactly what I expected, so everything's fine. Uh, and we can look at the sequence. I can either download the sequence file or I can just look at the sequence directly right here. And so here's your DNA sequence. 
Now you see where it says N, obviously N isn't uh, a nucleotide, so it's not A, T, C, or G. But in this case, uh, N just means any nucleotide. So there's codes for unknown. And N just means there's something there, but we don't know what it was. And that's always going to be there with um, Sanger sequencing, because this is where the primer was sitting. And anything really close to the primer is going to be messed up. Anything towards the very beginning and the very end isn't going to be right. That's why you really, if you're looking for something specific, you want to be at least 100 base pairs upstream of the thing that you're looking for and then make sure that you've got at least 100 base pairs downstream of the thing. If you get too close to the ends with the important piece of information that you're looking for, you might lose it. So, uh, this is the sequence that I have. Copy that. Now, I can check this sequence, assuming I had no idea what this was. Let's say I genotyped a plant, and I have no idea what this plant is, I want to identify it. Uh, one thing I can do that's pretty easy is I can do BLAST. Now BLAST is uh, it's a government website, it's a, it's a basic local alignment search tool. It is a huge government database full of uh, genetic data and you can search it with these alignment tools so they can find even imperfect matches. And you can BLAST in a variety of ways, you can look for protein sequences, you can look for DNA sequences all kinds of things, all kinds of ways to look at it. You can search genomes, you can search RNA, you can search all kinds of stuff. But for today, we're gonna go nucleotide blast, and I'm just gonna paste this in here. Ends and all, don't worry about it. It will figure out what that's supposed to be. Um, now, you can tell I've done this before. Uh, this might be somewhere else. You can, if you don't know what it is, you can usually go nucleotide collection, and that'll be, you know, everything, all the DNA in their database. Um, or you can look for reference sequences if you're, are, if you're looking for something specifically genomic. If the thing you're looking for is a gene that produces a protein, then you'll get a lot of RNA as well. So because the sequence I'm looking at is part of a gene and it is protein producing, there's going to be a lot more RNA sequences in there. So I'm going to look for a reference genome. And since I'm looking for a specific genome, if I were looking to identify an unknown plant, uh, then I would just let it run uh, without the organism identified, because I don't know what organism I'm looking for. But in my case, I'm looking for uh, this sample that I sent off of Vulcan the dog, and so I'm going to look for dog. So I'm going to look for Canis familiaris, or Canis lupus familiaris. And so that's the Latin name for dog and blast. Now it'll take it a while, it's got to run the algorithm, and it's going to compare that sequence, um, sort of, you know, sliding it around the genome, and it's going to look for the different uh, things that may be matches. And if you narrow your search, like I did, you'll get very few. If you do a very wide search, like all the nucleotides in their database, you'll get hundreds of results. Um, if you know what you're looking for, it's best to narrow it so you don't end up with 500 results. Let's see. But if you take a bit of leaf or a bit of unknown, like you found a bone and scraped out some marrow and you wanted to identify what it was, you run the sequence, you'll get a, a variety of matches, and uh, sometimes DNA sequences are the same from species to species, especially with uh, what they call conserved sequences. And that sort of thing is like um, DNA that if it mutated, it would probably kill you. So those things are um, usually very slow to mutate. And so you may find a sequence that dogs, mice, pigs, gorillas, and humans all have identical sequences, right? Okay. So here we're going to look at our results, because we just searched the dog genome. And so you can see, uh, these are the two that it found. Uh, this is the reference genome. So this is sort of the, the standard reference genome. It was done with a boxer female. Um, and then uh, this is the query here. It covers 93%. And the reason it's 93% and only 99.23% identical is all those ends. So obviously all these ends up here don't 
show up in the genome. And we can look at the graphic summary and you can see this is where it didn't match. So this is the query we sent and this is what they found that matched. And you can see it's just this little bit at the end right where uh, all this uh, garbage is. And that's what didn't match. So we can look here and we can say, ah, well, my sample is obviously dog and I can look at it. And I know that the mutation I'm looking for is going to be about in here somewhere. Uh, and I don't see anything that deviates from the reference genome. So I know that my mutation's not there. Anything that did deviate would come up here like these, where that N doesn't match with that A and so on. The subject in this case is the, uh, the genome DNA, uh, the genome sequence, and the query is the question that we asked it, what is this sequence? And so uh, the, and the numbers here correspond to where that is on the um, genome. So if you look at, uh, so this is the 26th base pair to the, this is the 85th and 145th and this one's the, whatever that number is, fifth, and so on. And these are, this is where to line. So it perfectly fits with dog genome. So that tells me a couple of things. One, it tells me that my sequencing worked. I, uh, I blasted into that. And furthermore, it tells me that this is, uh, let's see. So it comes from this sequence, but it tells me the gene, right? So this solute carrier family two, see what we sequenced. Oh, this is going to be the whole shotgun sequence. Nope, nope, nope. There we can see. Okay. So this gene here, this is SLC289. That's the other name for it. Um, but... Uh, let's see, so if you're doing genotyping, you're going to come up with a barcode sequence here, uh, which are some of these uh, slow to change genes that are uh, very similar from species to species. And so those, um, uh, those can be used as markers uh, because it may be one or two bases different from species to species. And so you can identify on the species level whatever it is. It'll be, uh, depending on what you're genotyping, it'll be that barcode gene that we use and then it'll tell you the species. Now if you're doing what I'm doing, uh, I'm looking for a mutation. So I've got another thing I want to look at. Now I already pulled uh, the dog genome. This is snap gene. I already pulled the dog genome and I'm looking at uh, these are the two sequence or these are the two primers that I used for my PCR, right? And this is the mutation I'm looking for. So this G is what's normal. The mutation is a T and that causes a genetic disease that kills dogs. Um, and this is only highlighted because that's a PAM site and I'm trying to target it with CRISPR because it would cut it right there and be perfect and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, one of the things you can do if you have the full version of um, SnapGene is you can align to a reference sequence. So I can align to a copied sequence, uh, which is the sequence on the clipboard for the computer. And so you can see these ends, again, don't line up. There's a little gap here, but don't worry about anything this close. And then we can scroll down and we can see there's no real differences. Well, let me delete this one. Let me hide that one. Okay. And so we can see that right here, where there's supposed to be a G, there is a G. So the sequence that, that I got back from um, GeneWiz matches here and I don't see the mutation. If the dog had been sick, if the dog had had the mutation, this would be a T instead of a G. And so I know that this dog doesn't have that genetic disease. And I can... use that uh, to genotype puppies or if I have a whole litter, I could swab the whole litter, run PCR on the swabs, send it off, check each puppy to see if they have the mutation. Um, or you could even do people, right? And so the primer that I sent them was this forward primer and 
it just sequenced this way until it got to the end. And then it just stopped. And that's why this whole sequence was short, because this whole thing is short. Now, uh, let's see, check real quick. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so the primer should be uh, 100 base pairs away from your S&P of interest because if it's too close, uh, it can mess up the sequencing results. So, um, like you see, I'll show you a good example. Let's back up and look at the alignment. sequence. Okay. Oh, I've added another one. It's fine. See, if we look at it on the level of the map, so my primer's here, and there's uh, a missing part where all those ends are, and then some other small errors, and then it starts reading beautifully. And then here's my mutation, about 300 bases away. So, all in all, this one's about 300, but you don't want to get any closer than 100, because you can see I'm not too far from already being just on the other side of this mutation. If I had had my S&P about right here, it would have been right in the middle of all those ends, and I wouldn't have seen anything. So if so, from the beginning of your primer, at least go 100 bases, because that's what's going to get you clear of these uh, errors, and also don't get it too close to the other end. If this had been longer, uh, it would have eventually just sort of tailed off. And, and we would run into the same kind of mess at the at the other end. Let's take a look. Uh, when you submit the form to the genomic sequence, you provide the primer sequencing as an attachment. Uh, I think that's next week or or a little bit further down as far as submitting sequences to GenBank. So we'll cover that then. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm getting this figured out eventually. Okay. Okay, so as far as the alignment goes, uh, does everybody feel comfortable with understanding what happened there? Let's see. So, let's see. In the, and your PCR primer may not be usable for your um, sequencing primer, uh, because again, it depends on the location. So because this one is so short, you know, I have the reach but that's the other thing. If your PCR product is like 4,000 bases and the thing that you're looking for is somewhere in the middle, you're also not going to be able to see it because PCR, because Sanger only goes about 1,000 at best. And so even if you did it from both sides, you wouldn't reach the middle. In which case, you can just design a, sequ a sequencing primer, and it follows basically the same rules as uh, a PCR primer because it's basically the same tech. You just go from where you are, back up about 100 bases or so, and then look for a good uh, primer spot. Uh, you can check with the uh, you can check with um, GeneWiz. They're, they've got a whole thing on pr uh, sequencing primer design because they have sort of standards that they work from. And I think they want around 60 degrees uh, TM and things like that and you can design your primer uh, and you can put and just remember one thing that will throw you if you use your reverse primer is you will get a sequence that is the reverse complement of the sequence you're seeing now so the sequencing machine doesn't know what your DNA is supposed to look like 
So it will. If I had this one, if I had used SLC 2A9 reverse, it would have started here, except that C C A C would have been right here. C C A C, right? So this would have been reading sort of upside down from the bottom. And now blast doesn't care. It'll find it anyway. It compares it sort of all directions, right? And if you have snap gene, the full version, and you do an alignment, it'll do the same thing. It will also compare it sort of all different directions. That's really all those algorithms do. And so, uh, let's see. So if you order from here, you'll get a sequence that can be very, very confusing. Uh, and it'll look like complete gibberish if you start really looking at it, or if you're trying to manually compare sections because you'll have, again, the reverse complement. Not just the reverse and not just the bottom strand, but upside down and backwards. Now, remember DNA has a five prime, three prime, so the easiest thing to do if you need to turn it around in SnapGene is you take your sequence that they give you, and you copy it, you'd go SnapGene, paste your new sequence in there, and you can hit reverse complement. And it'll flip the whole thing around for you. So now it's upside down and backwards. And so now it looks like a completely different sequence. But had they sent me this from uh, uh, from GeneWiz, then I could have just made a new one, paste it in there, reverse complement. Okay, and then bam, there we are. That's our original sequence again. Okay, let's check the questions. Uh, what length makes sense for Sanger sequencing? Uh, usually, I look for um, uh, usually I look for things like. 800 or less. I really don't like stretching it out to a thousand. Um, I try to, if you if you need to sequence a longer sequence, you can do something called primer walking. Um, and they'll do that automatically for you if you tell them you want to primer walk something. There's a whole service for that. Um, but otherwise, basically, they'll just have a primer here, and you'll sequence it. And let's just assume this was longer. Actually, I have this. This is 10,000 bases of the Dalmatian genome, right? Or actually the dog genome, right? This is chromosome, part of chromosome 3. And this is where the mutation is, right in here. And so here's my primers. This is the same sequence we were just looking at, except uh, it's got about 5,000 bases on top and bottom. So this is sort of in its genomic context. Uh, but if I wanted to sequence a bigger thing, if I were going to sequence from here, uh, I would, you know, I could start from this primer, and it would go, you know, about a thousand bases, which would cover the thing. But if I wanted to go back, I would back up to about five or six hundred bases, do another primer, and go there, back up, do another primer, and go there, back up and then you walk down the whole thing until you can assemble all the different reactions into one big long sequence, right? And that can get expensive if you have to do something really, really big, like um, uh, if you want to have to do something really, really big, like um, um, oh man if you have to do something really, really big, like a whole genome or whatever, a whole chromosome, then, then Sanger sequencing isn't the technology anymore. At that point, you need to start looking at uh, next generation sequencing and things like that. But, let's see. Uh, as for GeneWiz, let's see. When you submit a form uh, to GeneWiz for sequencing, do you need to provide the primer sequences as an attachment? No, you don't. Uh, they don't need to know the primer sequence. Uh, all they really need to know is that the primer uh, has the right TM and the concentration because they they don't even look at the sequence really. Uh, they just load a robot and the robot runs a reaction and then 
the machine spits out this, really. I'll show you. So this is the trace file. Uh, if you download it, you can open it in Snapgene. Make sure everybody's seeing this. Okay. Okay, so this is the trace of the sequence we were just looking at, right? So this is what came out of their actual machine, right? And it's a bunch of, this is how Sanger sequencing gives output in these sort of spikes of color as the DNA fluoresces on their chip, right? As it's being assembled. And so each spike corresponds to a different letter of DNA uh, because they're, they're labeled differently. The quality of the spike uh, as far as like how noisy it is, you can see from the beginning over here, it's garbage. It's just, they can't tell what any of this mess is. And if your whole sequence looks like this, it, you're not, you don't really have anything you can read. Um, it should even out and get really nice and clean like this. This is a good high quality read. It's very obvious, you know, this is a blue spike, this is a black spike, this is a red one, and so on. And so you get these very clean, uh, bits of information and so this is what the machine actually spits out and they don't know they don't even look at this um, they look at the quality score uh, and they look at sort of like the metadata of it and then give it to you and uh, so they don't need to know the sequence they don't need to know any of that why do we boil the cells in an AOH so you do that to help break the DNA out of the cells so if you just you can uh, just sort of like mush cells and DNA will come out, but the idea is to uh, re damage the cell membranes enough that DNA leaks out, uh, and then when that happens you can collect it, because you're leaving most of the cell debris behind. So you're leaving all the chunky solids uh, in the bottom of the tube, and you're just taking some of the liquid off the top, and so that liquid should contain your DNA, and busting through both the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane takes a little bit of doing. It's not as bad uh, in animal cells as it is with plant cells. Plant cells obviously are a lot tougher and they have PCR inhibitors um, in the sugars of their cell walls, but uh, yeah, that's, that's why. You're just using the heat to kind of accelerate the chemical reactions that sort of dissolve the cell membranes and make them into goop. But okay, so we've covered um, how to set up your uh, sequencing reaction, how to physically package it, um, uh, how to read the results once you get it, um, and then uh, using both BLAST, and you can get all kinds of other interesting information from here. Uh, you can also put these in like genomic context. Uh, so you can get it to show you which, for me at least, uh, seeing it in this form is helpful because this is like the dog genome. And so this little line here is my query. But you can keep zooming out and then other genes start popping up. You can see, okay, well here's this, this is the whole SRC, SLC2A9 gene. And you can back all the way up and you can see all these different genes. And this is just, you know, one chromosome, right? And so you can sort of pan around the dog genome, and there's our SLC2A9 right there. Um, and you can see sort of what's surrounding it and things like that. And you can also copy, you zoom all the way to sequence, you can also copy sequence directly from here. Uh, and then we covered also manipulating DNA results in SnapGene, um, so that you can read them and you can compare your primers and uh, you can look for specific uh, SMPs and I got this SMP's location uh, from the paper uh, because you can see the sequence right there so in this little piece so here's the um, healthy dogs or, or excuse me the unhealthy dogs and these are the uh, high uric acid or excuse me these are the low uric acid dogs and high uric acid dogs and so on and they compared like mice and humans and different breeds of dog and so on. 
Uh, receive DNA extraction buffer also. She will replace the NaOH with the DNA extraction buffer in the experiment, or is there an additional step where she uses the DNA extraction buffer? That I'm not sure of. Josiah did that part. Um, there's an additional buffer that I'm not familiar with. I have always just uh, done the NaOH and boiled them, um, but I've mostly always done that with uh, human and, and dog cells. Uh, and that's always worked really well, but it depends on what you're doing. And so as far as with the plants and stuff, I know he sent another buffer, but I'm not familiar. Uh, I'll ask Josiah to answer that. Uh, but I do think the uh, protocol has been updated on the classroom site, so you should be able to see it there. Any other questions before we go? So Josiah's answering here. Uh, yeah, it's for the plant cells. But as far as do you add it, let's take a look at week. Genotyping plants. Yep, it's been updated. So if you look at the um, uh, plant genotyping uh, document on the classroom site, you'll see the updates, looks like. Yeah, one microliter plant plus DNA extraction buffer. Seven. We started a couple minutes late, so I'll give you a couple more minutes of uh, but it might stop. Okay, if this is, st I think this automatically stopped streaming, but um, if not, uh, I will see everybody next week.